Dan Freeman, pastor, Peace Lutheran Church, Chehalis, Washington. I just have one question for you, Scott. Um, did you include you and your wife's hometown in your bio just so that you could take some sadistic pleasure in hearing a Midwesterner butcher the pronunciation of Puyallup? Yeah, it's, uh, I've never ever met a person who got that right on a first or second try. <laughs> I think it took me a few years to learn. <laughs> Puyallup or Puyallup, one or the other. Pastor Bruce Lay, Pastor Emeritus, Holy Cross, Albany, Oregon. Uh, that reminded me briefly of another, what you call, mispronunciation. I remember back in, uh, when Dan Rather, I think, was still CBS or something, they had a windstorm that went through Wapato, Washington which is actually pronounced Wapato. <laughs> it's one of those Indian names like Puella. Thank you for your presentation. It was the first two paragraphs that prompted, or that concerned me to learn there was nothing at this past convention about TCM. Uh, after having, what was it, three or four conventions asking about this thing. Uh, they're no longer RSO status, but with 32 of our 35 districts, 1,200 congregations buying into this thing, that's, uh, we are 6,000 congregations in the LCMS. I think, I'm not sure that the 1,200 may include congregations in other Synod slash denominations, they never, I, it's in the footnote, I don't know where they get that particular number. Okay. And the, the 32 districts, I'm sure, are varying degrees of participation. And it seems that each district wants to kind of make it their own program, so they modify here and there for however they want to do it. So it isn't all necessarily identical. And I think the 32 districts probably is somewhat optimistic and okay. I, I came up through the business world and learned Peter Drucker very well mm -hmm. and so this is a very frightening thought that we have so many congregations that are even playing with this well and most people don't know that this is all really a business program as opposed to anything out of the scriptures and unless it's pointed out to you, you kind of go with the flow to a certain extent. And TCN is very good at training the pastors to follow the paradigm. They have uh, like an initial foray into this is 14 lessons that are pretty hardcore where you read an entire book on this or that subject from a non-Lutheran author that's maybe on leadership or some other topic. And so they use all of that material to change your way of thinking. And you come out walking and talking like somebody that's not even a pastor necessarily with a whole new vocabulary. Well, it sounds like we need the ACELC uh, to somehow uh, get a few more congregations that are willing to uh, f speak out with us against these kinds of things and uh, appreciate very much your, your paper and uh, I, I look forward to reading the footnotes. Yeah, there's a lot of those. <laughs> I think there's so many I accidentally cited something twice so <laughs> it's like uh oh <laughs> too late now. Uh, Pastor Alex Lang at uh, Holy Cross in Albany, Oregon. Thank you, Scott, for this enlightening and terrifying paper. Um, <laughs> didn't know half of this. This is uh, concerning. Uh, I was especially uh, shocked with the whole the vision casting. I mean, I've heard of that before, but to see just what they say about it, I mean, I, th I thought to myself, wow, it, it sounds almost, it, it sounds very similar to kind of like the, like they're treating it like the prophetic Prophet, prophetic visions of the of the early church, you know, the first century, you know, the, where the Spirit was giving uh, visions and insights to these people, you know, and so, you know, the Lord says there's a famine on the way that's going to strike Jerusalem, that sort of thing. I mean, it sounded very similar to that, that, you know, this vision that I have for the church is from the Holy Spirit. If you question me, you're questioning the Lord, you're doubting the Lord, you know, 
and it made me think, wow, it just sounds like our own, like very similar to the pe Pentecostalism and that they're yes. taking some sort of idea, like these, these immediate spiritual gifts from the first century and assuming, oh, it's that we're, we're going to get the same thing here. And it just, I, I just have to, I just wondered, uh, it, how involved are, are Pente is Pentecostalism and uh, charisma that charismatic movement involved in uh, TCN, or how how involved is TCN with that pe the, those Pente that Pentecostal charismatic? I mean, I guess I'm kind of wondering, like, is there any? You know, they're doing this vision casting. Are they also? Is there any? Do they at any time advise churches to look into some of the other? quote, spiritual gifts, you know, uh, you mean, you guys should be really should be open to speaking in tongues or something like that. Because it just sounded so similar. I'm just kind of curious to know yes. how, how much they're in bed with the Pentecostals. Um, it's, I would say that part of it is relatively minimal. They're, they don't emphasize spiritual gifts. And the whole vision casting thing, as I thought this over and read what they have said, they seem to not even know themselves what it means to them. So, you know, one day they'll say it's this, and another day they'll say it's that. So there isn't really a large component that I would think has a Pentecostal bent to it, but there is a definite hint of enthusiasm in their writings. Both uh, Terry Tiemann, who's the president, and Dwight Marable have said some things that definitely are enthusiasm really just plain and simple so there is some of that there I did consider from a gospel reductionism standpoint you know they have kind of an end time scenario often involved with gospel reductionism and I sort of pondered that as far as it related to TCN if they were in any sense um, promulgating any of that and I don't really think they are but at the same time I think you can end up there just via their system so it's something to guard against, which, of course, they're not really doing. Thank you, Doctor. It was great. Um, I've got a two-part question, Shocker. Um, first of all, you know, the, the, the reason that I asked you to be here was because eight or ten years ago, you wrote a long series of articles that were posted on Brother John Steadfast exposing Transforming Churches Network, getting people thinking, digging into what was really there. And I, in light of our mission conference uh, this week, I wanted you to, you know, continue that and expand that and share share that so we would have the hard data. And that's exactly what we have. The, the footnotes are pure gold. Nobody can say this stuff doesn't exist. You told me recently that this isn't really a particular area of interest for you. That's true. That is true. Okay. Are, is everybody else shocked? Okay. But it's kind of like you, you feel like you need to do it just for the sake of the church. How in the world did this topic uh, come into your wheelhouse or your head or your heart? How did it get on your radar for you to put this kind of time and energy and devotion for the sake of the church? That's part one. Okay. Um, well, when I wrote the, the first series of articles, I think it was nine parts, I was at that point a blogger, so I was always looking for things to alert people to, and I suppose I came across it, maybe somebody else mentioned it in Brothers of John the Steadfast, or somehow I came across it, which is when I started researching it, and I, I found that a lot of their source materials were online one way or another, which was quite helpful because they really are not very transparent most of the time. So it was quite helpful. And just as a word of encouragement for everyone, I think even though, you know, I wrote that paper way back when and this one now nine years or ten years later, they really do have an impact on the Synod and on TCN too because I know TCN obviously read that. I know that paper went to a lot of places in the Synod, you know, board of directors of various districts and that kind of thing. So 
it does have an impact, even though we may not really see it operating, but it, it does happen, and I had a lot of people email me on that, so. Okay, part two. The, the fact that no overtures were written to the Synodical Convention regarding TCN would give people the impression that either, on one hand, people are comfortable with TCN and they're not uh, nervous or worried about it, or on the other hand, that they think TCN is gone from the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod simply because it no longer has RSO status. The day that I talked to you on the phone about whether you would be willing to be a presenter or not, I had in my head, Transforming Churches Network is dead in the Missouri Synod. That day, I got a flyer in the mail, and you reference it in one of your footnotes. I got an email yesterday, or the day before, Monday or Tuesday this week, Transforming Churches Network is not dead. It has gone underground, and the fact that it's not an RSO status puts it in stealth mode in our churches. What word do you have for pastors or laymen that are here or that have friends, brother pastors, relatives in churches where this stuff is being implemented either in part or in whole? How would you encourage them to talk to their leaders? Talk, yeah, what, what should they do? Where should they go? I mean, aside from fleeing and going to a different church. So where should the, what should the layman do? What should the layman do? Pastor out of the seminary gets a call, boom, he's in a congregation and he's expected to kowtow to, uh, to these things. What do you do? Well, that's a tough one for the pastor. If there's a pastor that's called to a congregation that's already implemented this, it's, a, it's an uphill battle for him. As all you pastors know, you don't just go into a con congregation and immediately change everything. So it's going to take long and thorough catechesis. I think for pastors that already are in a congregation that doesn't have this going on, that it's still catechesis. You have to catechize your flock. And I'd encourage all you pastors to give your parishioners tools to use out in the real world. You know, it's, it's one thing to know the catechism, which is really, in theory, all you need to know. But to know it thoroughly and be able to apply it sometimes doesn't happen for us laymen. And just as an example, if you take a bad sermon that somebody wrote, preached, show that to your parishioners and emphasize this is why this is bad. Because a lot of times we fall into some little trap because it sounds like something Christian, but it may be off here or there. And it's important for us to be able to recognize those things. And um, like Issues Etc., for instance, they do a good job of that. Chris Roseborough's on there often talking about something that I, I listen to and think, well, I, I didn't know that, and I probably would have fallen for that had I not listened to this. So, you know, catechesis is really important and encouraging your parishioners to study up. Learn your lesson, as Dr. Hines said. Yes, sir. Uh, Pastor, Pastor James DeLoach from Kearney, Nebraska. Uh, Pastor Poppy anticipated my question uh, regarding if you'd had those conversations at, at certain levels. Um, I was wondering if you'd had the same with, with uh, Pastor Robson at the National, uh, the National Office of Mission. And uh, to, in, I guess, encourage you, I, it does look like at the synodical level, at least, they are uh, trying to develop something, taking into, I, I imagine, taking, taking to heart some of what you've told them. Uh, and, and basically, to parroting some of what uh, Pastor Richards had talked about yesterday regarding the emphasis on inviting uh, primarily, and then welcoming and receiving people into the congregation rather than doing this uh, false total transformation of who we are type thinking. Um, at the district level, however, I know that this, it's been 
swallowed hook, lining, and sinker. So I appreciate the uh, elements that you put before us and the resources you've put before us. Uh, have you had those conversations at the national level, and uh, are they being fruitful, I guess, is my question. I haven't had the conversation. No one's called me on the phone, so no. Um, and I don't know. I don't want to speculate on why that is. Maybe it's my own fault for not bringing it up with someone. Um, you know, some of the districts, like you said, have swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, and they're really into it, and I think others are minimally into it. But it is there, and it's, it doesn't seem like it's going away. But I don't, you know, anecdotally, I heard uh, someone told me that they'd heard their friend talk to the district president. The district president said that TCN was dead, not because it had bad th theology, but because it didn't work. But, you know, whether or not that's true all over, it's just hard to tell. Oh, yeah, it's not dead here yet. They, um, I did look at how many consultations they've done with churches that go through the whole thing. And I came up with a number that was only like one a month. So it's not, okay. you know, it's not a huge rate that they're doing that, but I don't know how accurate the number is either. I'm assuming since you're presenting this publicly that it's okay if I were to share this with other leaders, synodical leaders? Oh, yes. Good. By all means. Very good. Appreciate it. Scott, Pastor Jack Kirk, I'm retired from full-time active ministry, a member at Good Shepherd in Lincoln. This is, the, everything that you've laid out is quite American. It's quite the way American business goes. It's how our people are trained to think anymore today. And uh, even if this goes underground, uh, that may not be a good thing either because the thinking isn't going to change. It's going to move more in this kind of a direction. What do you see as the future of how this is going to go? You know, have you even thought about it from where it is today, not an RSO in, in the Missouri Synod, yes, but uh, as far as its acceptance in many places, that people are looking for something to grow their church in numbers. They don't want to trust the word of God anymore. They'll trust their, their eyes and their ears. And someone comes up with a better looking apple, uh, they may uh, just uh, go ahead and take a bite of it all over again because there's just enough, just a, a smidgen enough truth in this to make it sound, you know, very Christian and very reasonable and very workable. Whether it works or not is immaterial, but you can. You can certainly sell this product to a congregation. So do you see, you know, what kind of a future do you see for this? And uh, perhaps connected to that, is there a response connected with pastors, you must stay faithful to Christ and him crucified and risen for you. Justification by grace through faith and not abandon that message. But we're still going to have to answer the error that's produced by, by this demon. I'll, I'll step back and I'll let you uh, contemplate all of that for a moment. Okay. Well, you know, looking historically, as uh, Pastor Poppy mentioned, he gave a list of all of the different evangelism programs we've been through through the decades. And I'm not really sure that this is all that much different, although this is a little bit different animal because it's more pervasive than what those other programs were. It, it works on every facet of a congregation. But I do see a lot of congregations and pastors and laymen that fight against this stuff and they realize that something's not right. Maybe they can't articulate it right off, but I get emails from people that ask about it and want to know, you know, the same kind of questions you're asking. Is it still going on and what should we do about it? And, you know, I think there's enough um, doctrinally inclined people in our synod that can fight it and that eventually it'll be stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, Drew Newman, pastor of uh, Trinity Lutheran Church, Kearney, Missouri. Uh, I was curious, I, I know years ago when I read information about this that the pastors were supposed to sign a covenant after they developed their plan and that if the plan didn't, quote, work, that the pastor would agree to resign his call. 
and uh, and someone else could then come in and take over the plant. Is that still going on? Do you know? I, I don't know for sure. I don't know that it is, though. I have not seen anything about that. I think over the years since the program began, they have uh, been a little more, I don't know if you'd call it doctorally inclined, but some of the more crass uh, practices they've eliminated. But I don't think there's any difference in the doctrine at all. The doctrine itself hasn't changed. The way they have done some things has changed, but I think there's still um, uh, a Calvinistic Arminian bent in the whole thing where there's any theology at all, and that's still there. It hasn't changed. And you can, you know, the, the stuff I presented certainly, you can see all the little nuances in all those quotes that reflect something that is definitely not Lutheran. So even though they're less crass, but it's, all the theology is the same. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed your paper. And as you were talking, uh, just something just flitted through my head, and I just like to get your reaction. I thought this almost sounds like some form of of revivalism. Def definitely, um, I only had forty five minutes, <laughs> or well, it ended up being fifty, but I had forty five. But I looked at that. I mean, I looked at it from a lot of different perspectives, and I couldn't present on all of them. But certainly there is a pietistic bent to it uh, that is in there, and because of that, it has some of those same characteristics that will hang out in that program until they get rid of it. So, yeah, there is definitely somewhat of a revivalistic uh, bent to it, and, you know, like I said, how they denigrate people that aren't haven't been transformed, congregations that haven't been transformed, it's like they take, they want to take it to a whole different level. Like there's a two-tiered Christianity, which certainly a revivalistic kind of thing would do. So yeah, it's there. Marcus McKay, pastor, Advent Lutheran in Zinesville, Indiana. Uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, point of information. Uh, so Terry Tiemann was last a pastor in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which you mentioned and then became mission executive for the Mid-South District. And then after that was wrangled along with Dwight Maribel to write the majority of the materials for Ablaze. And SG Squared was written by Dwight Maribel specifically. Um, and, and, and then after that, then TCN was formed. Now what I found interesting, if you go to TCN's website today and you go to, I think it's on the contact page, they still list themselves as an RSO of the Missouri Senate. I saw that. So the first thing I did is I pulled out the, you know, I'm a little old school, I like books. So I pulled out the 2019 Lutheran Annual and they changed up how they list the RSOs, but TCN is listed in the 2019 Annual under missions or mission organizations or something like that. So then I thought, well, I'll go back because I've got the whole stack of annuals going back 10, 15 years. And I couldn't find TCN listed prior to 2019. So I contacted the Office of the President, LCMS Inc., as well as Information Office and Concordia Historical Institute. Um, the first two did not respond to me. Concordia Historical Institute said if I want information on TCN, I just have to read synodical uh, day, uh, uh, the day-to-day -day business from the conventions. So that wasn't helpful at all. But my, my point in that information is that um, there's a lot about TCN that is, I don't know if it's being swept under the rug by the Senate itself or just not dealt with. I mean, are they an RSO? Are they not? If you go to the LCMS website, they do not pop up on the list that is there, as you well know. Um, and so nobody's answered that question. Um, and then along with that, if you look at TCN's website, they list where they're at. So I actually talked with Terry Tiemann a few weeks ago, and I might talk about that later in my paper. But he mentioned, oh, yeah, you're in Indiana now. Oh, we're going to be down there in a couple weeks for a, another presentation. So there's a lot of districts that are still using that. And, and that, I think, is what's really scary. 
Um, and now the second thing, my question, sorry for that long-winded point of information. Um, have you looked at the new revitalization program that the Missouri Synod has now written and is employing supposedly as an alternative to this? Are you talking about like the evangelism part of things with the Lassie and all of that or something else? No, it's, it's a, if you go to the LCMS website, there, there's a whole new section on church planting and there's a whole new section on revitalization mm -hmm. as well. I have not looked at that. And it used to be TCN would be listed or encouraged on that. That has gone away, thanks be to God for that. But I didn't know if you'd looked at any of the new stuff that was being done. I have not. Yeah, regarding the RSO, I found in the, I think it was in 2018 where they had, the RSO status had been removed. I found that in the, whatever the name of the department is that reports on that stuff. Um, it was really unclear on that page what that meant. And I, on the latest RSO list, they are not on there, but I don't know. I, I did try contacting both the ladies in charge of that. I never got a hold of either one of them. So, as far as I could tell, they were not on the list, but I'm, yeah, it's unclear. Uh, maybe I missed this, um, but has, have any districts, pastors' conferences, or conferences condemned this organization or passed any resolute or brought any resolutions to a synodical convention to condemn it? Yeah, there's uh, not this convention, but the 2016 and the 2013 and the 2010, there were resolutions in there uh, against TCN. So it has been mentioned. I don't know district-wise. I've kind of forgotten that. Um, there may very well have been some of that earlier. I don't know. I'm not aware of any that occurred in the last cycle. In, in your opinion, how many districts would join in on, on if, if, if it were laid out as clearly as you laid it out, how many districts would join in on condemning this? On indictments? Is that what you said? On condemning it. On condemning I don't know. It? I don't yeah, know. Okay. A couple. Thank you for your optimism. <laughs> I can't refrain from saying this because I am one that can't stand reading directions <laughs> and the bureaucratic stuff. I just, you know, I avoid it like the plague. I'll, I, I, whatever. And I just think all this idea, all this, you know, oh, let's, how, how are we going to make Christians? How are we going to go out and grow our churches? Well, why not listen to Jesus? He says, make disciples of all nations. And how do you do it? You baptize them and teach them everything. And it's as simple as that. Why do they have to make us so complicated? Well, I think it's just human nature. I mean, we always want to be doing something. The more we can do, the better we make ourselves feel. Yeah. And so it's attractive to us because of that. It gets into the self-made work thing. So, you know, it's, it's well-intentioned people. They just get off track. And I mean, probably quite a few of us in, in this room have been there in one way or another, maybe getting involved in too many apologetics tasks than we really should have. And so at times, you know, you go out there and you do more than you should, and you really walk outside of your own vocations or callings. So it's always a danger. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.